are literally shaping the planet. Purpose is the only pathway to a regenerative future. We have a choice to stay with the status quo or to change. What is the point of trying to be just resilient when we can actually innovate? This uh, this topic is is one that um, I think we're, I'm beginning to become intimately familiar with uh, with my experience and and the whole point of this is to share uh, with the industry um, kind of the lessons we've learned um, and and let you guys decide for yourselves if this is something you want to pursue um, and so yeah with the I actually wasn't sure exactly uh, what we were going to share I still had to talk to my boss and and figure out what you know how much detail we want to go into and and what is the overall message we want to share so i left it open but i think really this is probably the better oh i'm sorry let me share my screen here okay do you guys see this behind me i'm Going playing with a new that. with a new tech uh piece of tech here so uh so if you don't see this you, you see it nick i i see it yep Awesome. Okay. All right. So yeah. So I want to change the uh, kind of the title kind of after the fact. So uh, I think this is is probably more matches it. And, and essentially, yeah, a contractor, Robin Zamorin, created its own tech startup, and we're here to share you what we learned. So um, real quick about Robin Zamorin. Uh, we are a general contractor in the southeast. Um, we were contractor of the year in 2019. Uh, healthcare is our bread and butter, and we're like close to 90% of our business is actually repeat business. So our our customers love us. Uh, we love our customers, our clients. Um, and so uh, about two years ago, like Nick said, we started uh, Build For, and it really wasn't Build For wasn't the beginning, but we actually had, uh, brought some products to market. Um, uh, and those are Slap Planner, Control Wiz, Timetable, and Plus Delta. And I'll, I, I can briefly share uh, what those are. But um, those are all, you know, wholly owned by by Robins, Robins and Morton. Um, and these products are, are, we actually got permission to play with cool stuff and and, and create some products um, for our company and, and and eventually for the industry. Um, so Slap Planner is a uh, digital, physical, hybrid last planner tool. Um, and again, you guys can go to build4.com to see all these products. Uh, control Wiz is an Xbox controller for Navisworks, which is a uh, you know 3D uh, building visualization tool. And we actually just introduced Control Wiz for Revit, which is a you know tool that architects and engineers use. Uh, and again, that lets you use an Xbox controller. Uh, for, for both those applications. Uh, timetable, which is a visualization tool for CPM schedules. So kind of similar to Slap Planner, but more visualizations. Um, and then Plus Delta, which I probably should have used today, <laughs> but that is to gather uh, feedback, you know, Plus Deltas. And it's a, you know, if you go to plusdelta.app is the app and, you know, you can create essentially, um, you know, feedback mechanism for events like this. Um, so, and then a little bit more about me. Uh, again, I've been in construction since 2007. I uh, worked for some big companies. Um, I served as a consultant for for close to half my career. I uh, have some big jobs, and, and I've been at Robbins Morton for a little over three years now. Um, so, I like talking about me. I'm kidding, but uh, the, the, I, I got to talk more about kind of what's happened in the last couple of years. So, 2019 was a great year, not just because of Build4, but I actually got married. Uh, it was pretty awesome. Uh, it's true what they say. Marriage is a blessing. Um, and then we also bought a house, right? Um, and the house uh, is our first house. So we both grew up in like the New York City area where homes are really small. Um, and then we lived in Miami for the last 12 years where, again, you know, it's pretty tiny. We actually moved from a 900 square foot one bedroom apartment to this gigantic house in North Carolina. Um, and it's huge. It's five bedrooms. Uh, we have more furniture, or we have no furniture. We have more rooms than we know what to do with. Uh, they're just empty. It's just two of us. We have no kids. Um, so, you know, it's gradually filling the home. Um, and then, crazy thing, 2020 happened, right? Um, so, 
all of a sudden I got to work from home um, and uh, I'm seeing my wife a lot more, which is pretty good the first year. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I have all these rooms and no office. So the, the, the natural train of thought was let's build an office. So I found a room that would be a good candidate for an office. Now, I'm a builder. I can't just buy a desk, right? I got to build a desk, right? It's my, I'm finally in a house. I can buy tools. I can figure out how to use a saw, right? Um, so yeah, so I went to work. And what does a BIM guy do when he wants to design a desk? He goes to Revit. That's right. So got into Revit. My wife is like, babe, you're spending four weeks on this desk just designing it. When are you going to buy some wood? <laughs> so First time designing a, a desk is, is actually a lot more than, than I could bear, uh, but I stuck with it. Um, and then here's me cutting some plywood. Uh, I'm assembling the cabinets from the plywood that I cut. I mean, everything is, I, I didn't buy anything built, like completely by myself, right? Uh, here are the base cabinets getting placed in the room. Uh, then I'm putting, putting up the shelves that sit on top of the base cabinets in the top. Um, here's some, I installed some lighting in a face frame, um, and here it is ready for paint. Uh, and then finally it painted. Now it's not a hundred percent done. You can see, uh, my head here. Um, there's still some uh, protection on the floor, but I actually need to put in the, the, uh, the drawers and attach the doors, uh, which I did this morning. Um, I don't have pictures from that, but it is almost done. I, I will share. If you guys want to follow me? I will share the um, you know the whole story with the finished pictures on LinkedIn probably in a few weeks when this is when I get everything all prettied up. Um, so yeah, so I built an awesome work from home desk, right? Um, so here is essentially what it costs: uh, about three grand in wood and lights. Um, $2,500 in equipment. I bought everything, a table, table saw, the miter saw. I mean, everything you can imagine. Um, about 150 hours of my time, maybe more. So that was about eight weekends. And also I hired a painter. There was no way I was going to paint that whole room with that desk by myself. Um, so in the end, it cost me about $7,100 plus eight weekends. Now, if you were to ask me before I started this, if I thought that it would cost $7,100 in eight weekends, I would have told you, no way. No, I'll be done. And I, I told my wife, oh, by the way, this does not include the design. <laughs> so I was like, I told my wife, ah, two, three grand, you know, versus the carpenter, which, you know, he quoted me 15 grand. I figured, no way. Um, so what did I get by doing it, my, uh, by doing it myself? Um, I got a hell of a learning experience. Um, but what I didn't get was my peace of mind and my summer. Uh, 2020 was, you know, an opportunity to, to go venture the North Carolina wilderness. And I missed out on that. So I'll have to wait until next year. All right. So what does this all have to do with build for? Well, I, I realized as I'm approaching the, the finishing stages of this desk um, that building this desk for the first time is a lot like building a tech product for the first time. I didn't know what it cost. I didn't know if I should outsource or if we should do it internally. Thought it would be a lot easier than it actually was. So, you know, are they any different? Yeah, product's a lot harder. <laughs> so uh, that's like any big undertaking, right? I mean, and the whole point here is, you know, People who need training, so carpenters, right? They, these people need training. They do their their um, trade for years, right? And they're expensive because they're good. I mean, they're going to do it better than you can. Uh, and that was really true. And I, I thought wrongfully. I thought, well, everything's on YouTube. I can I can pick it all up on YouTube. And yeah, YouTube made it possible, definitely. Without YouTube, this desk would not have happened. I probably wouldn't have even tried. Uh, so it made it possible. But definitely not practical. So uh, I want to share the some of the lessons learned also with Build for um, and and the four products that we've that we've created. Um, and again, construction guy here, right? Not a software guy, not a tech guy. And we built four tech products. Um, and these are kind of the lessons we learned. So 
Um, first, I'll talk about the business plan and then starting small, goals and KPIs, and then the exit strategy, which we don't think about. Excuse me. All right, so the rule uh, rule number one for a business plan when you're when you're getting into something like this is everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? This is one of my favorite quotes, uh, and it's absolutely true. Um, now, we had put together a plan that said we were going to make hundreds of millions of dollars. We were going to buy Procore. I'm kidding. We, we didn't get that ridiculous. But, uh, you know, we, we were like, oh, well, here, in Excel, it's easy, very easy. We, we're going to make millions. It's so easy. Um, so you can spend a lot of time creating a plan, just like I did with Revit. Uh, but when it starts, uh, you know, when time comes to start building stuff, like things change, right? Things happen and you kind of learn along the way, especially when you're doing something um, that you haven't done before. There is that learning experience. But really, you know, we need to ask ourselves, like, if it worked, what value would it bring? Okay. So, I mean, that was, that was a, uh, for, almost all for for a couple of our products we actually never thought about that we just thought oh we're going to build it and it's going to be awesome um, but we didn't think like what actual value would it bring um to our company and so uh, i think we had different departments that had different things in, in their mind but we they actually we never aligned on this um so for the desk that i built the value is easy, um, you know, post COVID, there's gonna be a high demand for like luxury work from home offices, right? I mean, everyone's everyone's like, uh, liking the uh, the kitchens, you know, nice kitchens or nice bathrooms. In the post COVID world, it's gonna be the nice offices, home offices. Um, and there was also a place I could uh, work remotely. So uh, what I would say is, you know, ask yourself what value would it bring and like, you know, what do you want out of it, right? So I think internally, like myself and, and um, you know, I was thinking, well, we're gonna sell at a profit to the industry. Um, but actually there were, my boss was not thinking of that and I didn't know that until probably later than I should have known. Um, and his was was more like, oh, well, this is, this is an internal tool only. Um, and there, you know, there's other options of, of what you can do, but the whole point is you want to you want to highlight what it is that you want to achieve by doing this uh, product or by creating this product. Uh, the next thing that you really need to to get good at, and I would definitely recommend getting some outside help or input, uh, and that is asking yourself what resources will be needed. So for the desk, it was you know tools, uh, wood, hardware, paint painters. Um, but I didn't really sit down and, and, and kind of figure that all out. You know, when I started to do my takeoff for the wood, it was too late. I had already bought the, you know, the saw like two months earlier. So, you know, I was already too far in. There was, I was not quitting. It didn't matter if this thing was going to cost me 20 grand. I was going to do it uh, and go into debt doing it. <laughs> um, so I didn't do a really great job of estimating. And I, and I would say we probably uh, the same thing ha happened with uh, some of our some of our products. Um, we didn't do a great job of of figuring out how much it would cost us, what resources. Uh, if anything, we I think there was a, a a guess that you know people you know we were really passionate about this, and this would just be like something we could do on the side, you know, a couple hours a day, and you know it'll get done. In reality, products aren't done like that, right? Google has thousands of engineers. Apple has thousands of engineers. I mean. You can't do with one person. You're not going to be able to compete, or or you know be on the same level at all. Um, so you know that's that's really important. And and one other thing I want to add to that: um, software developers. So we actually didn't hire any software developers as employees. We we did outsource. And one of the biggest lessons learned uh, was that software developers are not commodities. Uh, I think in construction, a lot of us are used to you know, managing hundreds of painters or hundreds of electricians. Um, and it's about the number of widgets and, you know, you want to get the cheapest guy. I get it. Uh, but we seem to treat software developers like we also treat IT guys and even sometimes BIM guys, which is like, you know, 
we're just going to get the cheapest guy we can find. Um, and so you can find software developers in Brazil for, I think, tw less than $12 an hour, um, where the ones here in the States, the good ones at least, are 150 plus an hour, right? So uh, unfortunately, there was a huge misconception, and it was very hard and still hard, actually, to, to change people's minds that, like, you're not going to get the same output um, from someone that is $12 an hour as you are from someone that's $150 an hour. You know, you can make the argument all day. It's just, that's the fact. Otherwise, Google would just be full of Brazilian engineers and they, they wouldn't even be in the States. So, um, so that's really important. And, um, you know, I want to add to that, especially for BIM and IT people, I have noticed in my industry, Not I'm not talking about Robinson Morton. It's actually, you know, we're pretty lucky. We got a good um, BIM and IT department. Uh, but what I have noticed, humongous companies, they just hire the cheapest IT and the cheapest BIM guys you can find. Um, kids straight out of college responsible for, you know, $300 million projects. It's just, it's unrealistic. So, um, you know, we got to make sure that we, we get that taken care of. Um, and also make sure you have someone that is uh, acting as a product manager. Uh, so someone that is, that probably knows the problem is intimate with the problem, but also knows the, the users or the buyers uh, so if that's superintendents, then they need to be talking to superintendents and represent the superintendents. They, they are the kind of the CEO of the product. Um, hosting costs. Uh, a lot of times we've we've like spent time worrying about hosting costs. And reality is like, look, hosting costs are a non-issue. It's a good problem to have, right? So if your hosting costs are $10,000, it probably means you have a, a you know, a good number of customers or so there's a good amount of usage going on. Uh, then also I would consider prototypes uh, as a resource. Those are uh, a resource that you should use to just even evaluate if this is something that you want to do that not really so much for the desk, uh, but definitely um, um, for like a, a product startup. Uh, the other thing is start small. So that's number two. Um, you know, I like to say crawl, walk, run. Uh, and that's really huge. You know, so like prototyping is, is again, that's, that's your crawl. Like if you create a, a prototype um, using like a 3D printer, if you're making a, a physical product, but also there's, there's apps, free apps uh, out there. Figma and Adobe XD are great tools that let you create like essentially a, a user interface. It doesn't have to be a real product, but it can look like one. Uh, and you can actually fool people into thinking they're actually interacting with a real product. Now, these are free tools, so you can put something together in a weekend if you really wanted to. Um, and then there's also Adobe After Effects. <laughs> and so again, if it's a hardware product or even if it's a software product, you can use Adobe After Effects, which is essentially a video editing tool where you can add effects to it. You can make something look real in the real world or on, a, on the screen. Uh, so I would definitely... Um, do something like that. And when you do that, you can also, if you can fool people and I'm not trying to be like deceptive here, but if you can fool people into thinking that they're looking at a real product, you can also ask them for money. And so if they go, oh man, this is really cool. And you go, then you can say, oh, great. Um, can I have your credit card number? <laughs> uh, and if they say, oh, it's great, but not that great, then, you know, then maybe you got some more research to do, right? Uh, and then, of course, if they say, sure, here's my credit card. You go, oh, we're out of stock or, you know, actually, we haven't built it. You know, be honest, don't obviously take money. Uh, or the other option is like, hey, great. Um, you know, actually, this thing isn't built yet. You know, let's sign an LOI, letter of intent. Uh, you can get some some people to, to commit. Again, it's not a commitment like giving money, but, you know, usually an LOI, you know, involves talking to, you know, other people within the company. Um, so it's not like. It's not just a verbal, sure, I'm interested. It's, it's really a, uh, an undertaking just to get an LOI. Uh, keep in mind that there are plenty of companies that uh, raise millions of dollars uh, without actually building a product. They might build a prototype, but not an actual product. Uh, goals and APIs are number three. Um, this is something we also kind of, uh, we're a little bit late to the game on. Um, so goals align the team. Um, and usually, the, you know, they say the growth is, is you know, is should be like your your biggest goal. Um, that's if you're trying to like sell this at a at a profit to the industry. Um, but if you're not, even if you're just trying to use it in your projects, um, if people in your company aren't using this product that you've created, 
then that's an indicator that you know things aren't working. Um, and I, I just thought I'd, I'd share this image. I think this is a cool image of five ways to build a hundred million dollar business. And basically, on one end of the spectrum, you have uh, one customer paying a hundred million dollars, or you can uh, have uh, ten. I'm sorry, this is a thousand customers paying a hundred thousand dollars, or you can have a uh, hundred million customers paying uh, ten dollars, and that's how you get to a hundred million or whatever the the math is. Um, and so that's how you get there. Um, so a typical user, uh, I'm sorry. So other goals could be like just being able to do something, right? Again, if this is an internal product, um, you know, process X number of images, reduce labor by X number of hours. You know, these are goals, actionable goals that you can have and use, all right? I'm gonna step it up a little bit here. And then uh, key performance indicators or KPIs, uh, they keep the team grounded, right? So things like having uh, revenue or, or number of active users, these are really popular KPIs. Um, and this keeps the team honest. So if you have like an actual, um, you know, thing that, that defines what an active user is, like, you know, takes a picture or uploads a picture or something like that, uh, that's considered an active user. And so you want to track that, you know, weekly or monthly or even daily. Um, and that keeps everyone kind of on the same level. You know, if your thing is being successful uh, and you get to, you know, really see, there's a lot of benefits to it basically. So, um, and then lastly is exit strategy. This is a really tough one that I'm facing internally. And I, I think other constructions, all construction companies also have it. So like, let's just say, first of all, let's say if you're, you're winning, you know, like, okay, you're winning. So like you're, you have a, you know, great, you know, things are going really well. Like what, like, did you win? Um, I, I'm often hearing the, the the phrase like let's you know let's put a, a bow on this thing and, and wrap it up or you know when do we like you know when are we when do we just like uh, you know get rid of all of our developers and all our people and let this thing run run itself like no it's that's not a thing right there, there's you got to have support you have people onboarding uh, you know uh, there's updates you know there's there's a whole number of reasons you actually need at least one or two people keeping your thing afloat and, and working and this and that. Um, it's not like a building. A lot of builders seem to think building a tech product is putting, um, you know, ramping up your uh, <laughs> your manpower and then ramping down in the middle. And by the time it's turned over, you have no more staff working on it. And there's just like a janitor keeping it clean. Like that's, that's not how it works um, at all. Um, and then so the, um, so the exit strategy, if things are going well, is to sell to a big company like Autodesk, um, is to shut it down, um, let it die. Um, but more importantly, there is no, no done. Um, and then also, um, what's your exit strategy like for when things don't go well, right? And, and like you have to plan for it. Like people fail, it happens. Um, so make sure that that is something that um, that you've considered and have an exit strategy. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, we tried something awesome and it wasn't as awesome as we thought. Um, so again, kill it, shut it down, let it die. There is no done. All right. So those are the kind of the lessons learned. But, you know, the, the question is like, I so I knew that the desk should be built, right? But we, what we didn't answer was like, should I have built it or should we have gotten should I have gotten a, a contractor to build it? And so, I, you know, the answer is I don't know. Um, the one thing I can tell you is building product is very hard and you've, you can only stop when you've failed or sold. So if that's something that you're willing to, to accept, then I say, go ahead. Um, and then lastly, this is, uh, this is me. <laughs> um, on LinkedIn, there is my uh, the, the URL for me, and there's my uh, personal cell, as well as my emails, and that's a QR code that also brings you to LinkedIn uh, to me. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it up for uh, for questions if if anybody has any. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's an incredible presentation. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, regarding questions, I think we're going to direct questions to the Slack channel, please. So everybody is encouraged to uh, find Daniel on the Slack channel right now, later, anytime soon. 
and uh, and ask any of your questions. Thank you very much, Daniel. Great. Thank you.